And we are live. Welcome to another episode of the New York Information Security Meetup. And I have the great pleasure to have today a panel discussions. How do you know if it's fixed? Uh, find, fix, and verify your way to effective security. Um, it's uh, it's really exciting. I have uh, a tremendous panelist uh, uh, roster today. Um, Snehel Antani, who is the CEO of Horizon 3.ai, who is a former CTO of JSOC and Splunk. I have uh, Stephen Ramey, who is Director of Advisory Services of Arred, Arred Advisory, LLC. And Mark Rash, a computer security and privacy expert, lawyer, author, and commentator, former U.S. Uh, DOJ Cybercrime Unit. Thanks very much for joining me today. How are you all doing? Great. Excellent. So uh, when we uh, had it scheduled a while back, uh, the world was uh, slightly different. Um, you know, the Ukraine, Russian, um, you know, conflict was just something that, uh, you know, it, it was in the works. But now it's full on, um, you know, attack mode, uh, you know, this, this, this major conflict that's really affecting everybody around the world uh, from, a, you know, not just from a geopolitical perspective, but also cybersecurity. So why don't we, uh, before we jump in, maybe... Um, since I have you, uh, kind of the panelists here with each one of you with a tremendous background, maybe do a short introduction um, for yourself, like maybe one or two minutes, and then maybe some comments about what you've seen so far uh, in terms of, um, you know, kind of the cybersecurity current events. Who wants to start? Snehal? Sure, I'll start. So Snehal and Tani, I co-founded Horizon 3 about two and a half years ago now. Uh, my background, I was a CIO at G Capital, so spent time as a practitioner helping to secure, operate, and defend financial services environments, amongst other challenges in leveraging tech to drive revenue. Then served as a CTO at Splunk, helped grow and scale that company, and then uh, took a break from industry to serve within national security and joined special operations and just had a, an amazing experience solving some incredibly hard problems that truly mattered, working alongside some just inspirational leaders that you can learn a lot from. And from those collective experiences, saw an opportunity and started Horizon 3 doing continuous pen testing for our organizations to help them harden their systems before the attackers can exploit them. Uh, and there's a lot to, to talk about from a Ukrainian standpoint, but I'll pause there for the other bios. Let me go a second. Certainly. Hi, everyone. Steve Ramey. I'm a director in Arite uh, Incident Response. Um, Outside of uh, incident response investigations, my background, uh, I've been predominantly a consultant my entire career, uh, helping organizations investigate all the weird things that happen in their uh, technological infrastructure, uh, as well as setting up cybersecurity programs, assessing current cybersecurity programs to understand the, the maturity and the capabilities that they offer, and, and most recently matching a lot of that maturity into threat actor activity to identify um, the actual gaps that exist more so than just on the checklist that a lot of these these cyber frameworks are, um, and then a little bit before you know how these pen tests you know find a lot of the bad. So uh, a lot of uh, a lot of what I'm doing right now is to to help uh, organizations um, you know secure their perimeter, understand what their threat landscape looks like, and and uh, just mitigate as best they can the success of uh, these attacks that they're experiencing. And I'm Mark Rash. I'm with uh, the law firm of Corman, Jackson and Krantz, uh, and I lead their information security practice. And as a lawyer, I, I want to talk about here today also is about how we go beyond compliance and how we go beyond checklists and say, this is what the law requires, this is what NIST guidelines require, and go to actual security and how we move to an era that goes where you, where you don't simply say, I've done what I'm required to do, and you've actually done that looked at what the threat actors are going to try to do to you and mitigated those harms and risks. So that's really what you want to talk about. And uh, I had headed the Justice Department's computer crime unit. I prosecuted Robert Morris. I prosecuted Kevin Mitnick. I prosecuted Kevin Paulson. I worked on the cases involving um, uh, Bradley, Chelsea Manning, and um, I uh, also prosecuted the Gambino crime family out in Long Island. And I did uh, espionage cases against uh, Russia and the Soviet Union. So a uh, little varied background there. Yeah, very much so. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll probably have to do some other sessions, talk about each one of those cases as well. And just as a kind of, um, uh, you know, a note here, since this session is live and we're monitoring the kind of the various uh, social media 
uh, commentaries. If anyone has uh, questions uh, that are uh, arising from our conversation, feel free to put them in here. Uh, we'll monitor those and we'll try to answer uh, live on air. Um, so in terms of what's happening, I'm assuming you got phone calls from, you know, frantic, um, you know, customers, uh, people that you work with on a regular basis, uh, asking about what is kind of the impact of, of this, uh, you know, ground offense and as well as the kind of the, the cybersecurity associated with it. Isn't it the one of the first time in history where, um, you know, it kind of worked in conjunction like, a, you know, a ground offense with the kind of the cybersecurity uh, offensive attack? Uh, is that something that you've seen that before or is it is completely new? It, it has happened before. There have mm -hmm. been cyber attacks that have been done in conjunction with kinetic attacks, but never on the scale that we are anticipating. And I want to put the word here on anticipating. Um, one of the things you hear about is that, that how everybody uh, is surprised that there hasn't been more cyber attacks. And, and I think part of the answer there is we're, we're, we're five days in. And there's the, when you think about the cyber attacks associated with the invasion of Ukraine, you have to ask yourself, who are the operators? What are the tools and techniques that they have to operate? And what should people be doing defensively? The operators include the Russian government, the, which are the specialized units within the GRU who are dedicated to offensive and defensive warfare. The other parts of the Russian government outside the military complex, which are doing this as well, and then, to a great extent, Russians. These are Russian hackers. These are organized crime groups within Russia, opportunistic Russian uh, attackers who are trying to launch attacks in support of the Russian invasion. And there's lots of ways to do that. In addition, you've got these uncoordinated, massive Russian people and Russian hackers who just want to inflict pain. Uh, and so... There's, there's strategic and tactical stuff, and then there's this just massive people who are doing stupid stuff. On the other side, you've got, you know, geopolitical units, organizations, government agencies and stuff, and then you've got groups like Anonymous and, and uh, Ukrainian groups who are trying to do the same thing against Russian and Russian interests. And some of it is espionage. Let's find out who the, the oligarchs are. Let's find out where their assets are. Let's find the names of the Russian units and all that stuff. Some of it is disruptive and some of it is destructive. So it is a vast majority of uh, different kinds of attacks. Uh, and when we say, well, we're not seeing cyber warfare, we are. We've been seeing cyber warfare from day one. If I were to... Go ahead. I was going to build on Mark's um, Mark's point, which is, in for the first time, we're seeing this synchronized multiple vectors. So you've got cyber, which typically was a standalone activity previously. You have information operations, which was typically a standalone activity previously, and then you had kinetics, the actual bombs being dropped. And what you're starting to see is far more synchronization across those on both sides. By the way, so when you look at uh, kind of prepping the battlefield, the Russians were executing cyber attacks against uh, Ukrainian uh, government agencies, critical utilities and infrastructure and so on prior to the actual invasion occurring. You saw them trying to make attempts to talk about how Ukraine was really part of Russia and, uh, and so on from an IO standpoint with Facebook and Twitter and other messages on social media to help influence the hearts and minds of people both regionally and around the world. And then you have the actual kinetic effects. But I think what, to everyone's surprise, was on the flip side, it wasn't necessarily Ukrainian cyber, but rather um, uh, anonymous and other groups that wanted to help defend and stand up have started to attack uh, Russian critical infrastructure, in addition to commercial organizations trying to help improve Ukrainian defenses. You've got this brilliant I.O. war being run by the Ukrainians to help, to help rally the world behind them. And that's mobilized commercial entities, whether it's Maersk no longer allowing shipping or other uh, businesses that are starting to leave you, the Ukrainian or the Russian territory. And then, of course, you've got the kinetics that we see tragically on the news and the side effect of those. And so for the first time, we're really seeing all three of those layers being synchronized in a, in a multi a multi effect, multi domain battlefield. In, in the world is not is even though despite the fact that we're talking about in Russia and Ukraine, you know, I saw some numbers in terms of how um, 
you know, how the industries are all interwined. So it means that every company in the U.S. has some maybe, you know, maybe not even a second connection, maybe third connection to a company that's based out of Russia or the Ukraine. Uh, you know, do you see that as well from a supply chain perspective? I, I, would, I would chime in with, I think, two things. The, the financial and the commercial were probably the biggest surprises in the reaction. Mm -hmm. So the financial, of course, was uh, Western sanctions is one thing, but you're seeing other aspects of financial coming into play. And also the side effect of what role does crypto play yes. in circumventing financials. Separately, it's more the commercial impact that I'm surprised by when you've got um, businesses, whether it's Google, IBM, and others, uh, withdrawing from the Russian economy. I don't think people really anticipated that, at least at scale. And are they going to go back or not? It's a whole other conversation. But that opens up second order effects, which is one should expect that if Merck is going to pull out of the Russian economy, they're now on the Russian cyber uh, warfare radar and target list. And now what, are, what can Merck do to proactively harden and improve their security? Because you've got to expect that they're going to, there's going to be some retaliation as a result. And that points out two, two big factors. Number one, the idea that of the three factors, which, which are the, the cyber in support of kinetic, cyber as a, a front of warfare, and cyber as information warfare itself, the one that is the most significant and has been for the last several years is cyber information warfare controlling the hearts and minds, uh, altering opinion. Like one of the things that's happening within Russia is they are not allowing uh, uh, viewpoints other than those of the, the Russian government to permeate the, the society. So it's much easier for people to support what the Russians are doing from a military standpoint if they don't understand what its impact is. Conversely, on the, on the West side, they're trying to get the message out about what's happening. In combat, if you can just flood the zone with, with fake information, then people will not believe the true information. So there's this, this constant dialectic that's going on and this general distrust of information. And that's been going on for several years and something that the Russians are really, really good at. Uh, the Ukrainians are taking an opportunistic effect on it and they're, they're getting good at it. And that the United States has quite frankly not been very good at because we battle ourselves over information warfare and the like about messaging. But getting to the question of what you need to do to defend yourself in this area, I would absolutely agree that what happens is people are taking sides one way or the other, whether it's an oil company, an oil pipeline, a shipping company, uh, Facebook. And once you've taken a stance, you have made yourself a huge target, not only of the other side's uh, armed forces or intelligence agencies, but by radicals or third party groups that simply want to target you. And so you have hacktivism, you have organized attacks. And so you need to, what you, basically you need to do the same things you were doing before, only much more so and at a higher level with a higher, finer tuning. And, and I think you're right. I think there's, uh, you know, I think the private sector is definitely not ready for that. Right. So we, we um, you know, even without taking sides, they're, they're uh, behind the eight ball in terms of uh, trying to get themselves ready for any cyber attack, let alone, uh, you know, something from, uh, you know, it's being uh, coordinated from a nation state. Um, so so what are kind of the top things that uh, to look for in right now, if you are a an executive or you run a, um, a security operation center and uh, you're concerned in terms of what's what's happening from a geo geopolitical standpoint? Well, l let me jump in real quick and say the first thing to do is avoid complacency. Uh, there are a lot of companies who sit there go, oh, I just make widgets. I'm not involved in anything at all like this. I'm not part of the geopolitical strategy. Um, I don't need to worry about it. And from that, that's absolutely not true because First of all, you have dependencies. So, and so there are parts of your supply chain which may get a cut. But there's a lot of problem with blowback and secondary effects. Even if you, you so uh, during the last Ukrainian crisis, which was what, seven years ago, Merck, the pharmaceutical company, got hit by the non virus. The non virus was intended to be attacking Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, entities and some in Europe. But Merck got hit by it and suffered over a billion dollars worth of loss. Now, nobody would have thought that a New Jersey-based pharmaceutical company would be the target of a Russian attack related to, in, in that case, uh, um, Ukraine. But it was. 
and they suffered a billion dollars worth of losses. And what was interesting is they filed an insurance claim against their carriers, and their carriers refused to pay, citing the act of war doctrine, and said, essentially, this is the, the electronic equivalent to a bomb intended to hit, say, a Ukrainian military facility landing in Lindhurst, New Jersey, and therefore we're not paying. So one of the big problems you have is, is this, this idea of unintended consequences and blowback that's happening to you, even if you're not an intended target. If you build on that, look what happened to NVIDIA about a week and a half or two weeks ago, um, with, where they were compromised by allegedly a South American uh, ransomware group, and uh, they hacked back. You know, they have no legal authority to hack back. And if they effectively committed a computer crime, but they ransomware the, the, the ransomware organization. Right. And, you know, is that the norm going forward? I, I, you know, is that going to, to deter people from coming after you or not? What are the legalities around it? So you have an insurance issue with Merck. You have a hack back action that created some notoriety with NVIDIA. But um, what were the second order effects and the ramifications of them doing that? Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like it's, uh, you know, they're still going to be battling in court, even though despite the fact that the uh, insurance company lost, right, they have to uh, pay did. up. Um, but, you know, I'm assuming it's going to be in court for, for quite some time. And then that brings well, the, issue. the big difference is mm -hmm. that one didn't look like a war. Mm -hmm. This looks right. like a war. Right. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, it makes it makes sense, but it will still create issues with the all-encompassing, um, you know, uh, insurance policies where you know this the, the catch-all phrase of uh, you know force majeure, like uh, you know, or um, you know, act of war, because that would uh, not include some of these incidents. Uh, you know, depending on you know how do you how do you determine that was actually the act of war? Now everything is an act of war, right? Because it's because of the conflict itself. Uh, so Steve, depends what, what, it depends on who I represent. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, Steve, from, from your perspective, what have you seen, um, you know, companies since you're involved in incident response and have uh, uh, not just the end clients, but also MSPs that you work with and so on. What have you seen uh, in that regards? Like, is there an increase, an uptick in, in terms of, of the requirements of the concerns associated with uh, what's happening now from a geopolitical standpoint? Uh, absolutely, yeah. From um, from a business perspective, um, I've never seen a, a, a chatter so great. Um, the information sharing, both um, uh, via public sources like Twitter and Reddit, as well as behind the scenes um, through those through the back channels, um, everyone's finding information and sharing it. Uh, and it's up to you know the businesses to qualify what that information is actually doing for them. So, so um, you know the threat is real. The businesses, for, from what I'm seeing, are taking it seriously. Uh, because at this point, it's it's not if, but when, and that when is really hanging over but everybody's head. Um, back to, um, I think it was Snehal's uh, point of, of the SOC um, uh, operations, or maybe that was yours, David. Um, you know, everyone's on red alert. Uh, they don't know when this is going to happen. Uh, we do know that there was a huge jump in, in ransomware activity in 2020. Um, sorry, from 2020 to 2021. Uh, we just don't know when a lot of this is uh, going to come um, to fruition and actually see the attacks on, on these uh, American businesses as that blowback that's being indicated. And let's jump into uh, very quickly in terms of, you know, um, the, the kind of the topic of today is is how can can organization become more effective in, in terms of utilizing, uh, you know, the existing tools, existing uh, personnel that is responsible for cybersecurity. You know, it's not always... A, you know the the lack of resources. It's it's how effective those are, right? Snehal, maybe we can can jump into that. Yeah. So I'll give you a customer example first, or just a story that still shocks me. So uh, one of our healthcare organizations customers, they ran a, a self service pen test using our product. And our product, the way it works is, uh, it, it's algorithmic, it's autonomous. The more pen tests we run, the smarter we get. But we, we don't simulate, we actually do attack in a way that, that is safe uh, for you to run against production. And when they used us, we were able to dump LSAS, which is a critical process in Windows that hosts uh, credentials and passwords and so on. We were able to dump LSAS, laterally maneuver, elevate privileges, and become domain admin on the network. So for those on the, on the cyber side, we got the keys to the kingdom and we could have done anything we wanted when we get domain admin. But the customer said, I don't understand how this is possible. We have Fortinet as our EDR. 
that should have prevented you from dumping LSAS. We have all of these other tools for user behavior analytics that should have prevented you from laterally maneuvering. And we had all this instrumentation on the domain controller that should have alerted us to privileges being escalated. Yet none of those layers of defense work. So this healthcare company was doing the right things. They had spent the right money on the right tools, but these tools weren't designed to work together and they're easy to misconfigure. Right. So as we helped them understand what happened, turned out that Fortinet wasn't properly installed on three machines out of a thousand in the environment. And all it takes is one to not be configured properly for an attacker to compromise and, and gain access. So we helped identify these are the three machines where it wasn't configured properly, kind of number one. Number two, we're not sure why Fortinet didn't stop for us from laterally maneuvering. And as the customer dug in with their vendor, it turned out they didn't buy the right modules for their Fortinet install, which in itself was an awkward conversation between them and their sales rep. And then the third thing was they weren't logging the right data off of their domain controllers. And so the only way they would have realized these problems is if they were hacked. And by then it was too late. And so this idea that you might be doing all of the right things in your defense and depth strategy, but you've got to train like you fight and you've got to proactively verify your security controls and proactively harden your environment before the bad guys show up. So the best time to harden your environment is three years ago. The next best time to start is now. And with what's happening geopolitically, uh, being able to get ahead of and harden your environment as quickly as possible is an imperative from my point of view. Yeah, one, one piece I want to highlight that uh, Snehal said is um, uh, understanding what tools are in your environment, what they're actually doing. Uh, countless times when we set up for, you know, just a security assessment and we start talking uh, to the IT team, we pull contracts for, you know, certain products they've, they've purchased. Uh, we see there's a disconnect in knowledge. You know, they say they have a specific X, Y and Z product that's supposed to do A, B and C things. But when we actually look at the contract and we understand the product, there's night and day. So so sometimes the organization thinks they're getting a certain level of security and comfort from the, the tools they've purchased and implemented of uh, other times. What's actually in play may not may not actually be um, in reality. So whether it's a manual pen test or uh, autonomous pen test, uh, bringing that level of, of uh, activity into the environment, introducing that that behavior will really show and exacerbate what that uh, security tool is or is not doing. You know, and it's amazing, though, that they've already spent the money. Right. So they went through the whole process of implementing, spent the money. Uh, I'm assuming that the folks that were running it also got training and still there were you know, absolute gaps in there. And, and how prevalent is that? Do you think like, you know, and somebody can comment on this. It, we see it all the time. And, mm -hmm. and you have to understand that when attackers, particularly sophisticated attackers are attacking a system, they start with the assumption that you are compliant and doing the right things. And they say, starting with an assumption, how am I going to get in? All right. And the big difference is that if you're running a, a system based on compliance, yes, we have checkpoint. Yes, we have this. Yes, we have that. Yes, we bought this. And say, so, yes, yes, yes. Uh, what you're not looking at is how these things interplay with each other. I'm going to tell you a story which is likely apocryphal, but it is useful even if it is complete nonsense. And it's about a company that was hired uh, by the Defense Department to create a secure operating system. And so the, this, the chief information security officer said, I'm going to pay a $5,000 cash bonus to any employee who discovers a security vulnerability, not just in the operating system, but anything associated with our company. If you find a security vulnerability, get a $5,000 cash bonus. The next day he had to change it to one that you didn't create. Then he had to change it to <laughs> one that you didn't have somebody else, a friend of yours, create so that you could find it. But ultimately they... They were paying this bonus. And the head of uh, uh, HR calls him in after a couple of weeks and says, we have a problem. He says, what's the problem? He says, well, the problem is nobody's doing their job. Everybody's sitting around looking for vulnerabilities. We've got janitors going through trash cans for passwords. We've got people, you know, th th that's the only thing they're doing. And we've spent over a million dollars on these bonuses. And the head of product development leans back and, and smiles. And he says, so what you're saying is we have now incentivized everybody to look for vulnerabilities and we are more secure. We got $20 million worth of security by paying a million dollars in bonuses. And what we didn't tell people to do is how to do it. We told them, try to break in. If you find a vulnerability, you'll get money for it. And that's the way the hackers work. 
the hackers are doing it. You already have a continuous pen test program on your network. The problem is the results don't go to you. The results go to the bad guys. And so you need to be doing everything that the bad guys are doing on yourself, both internally. So if you want them to make your house secure, you can look up what kind of door should I buy? What kind of lock should I buy? What kind of window should I buy? Do these windows work with these doors? Does the security alarm system work with these doors and windows? All that stuff. And once you're done doing all of that and making sure you're configured properly, hire somebody good and say, break into my house. Then you'll find out if you're secure. And if that guy can't break into your house, hire somebody else and tell them to break into your house. And, and, of course, the easiest way for them to break into your house is to show up at your doorstep with an Amazon package. So remember that, too. Remember, the, the bad guys, you have to get it right every time. The bad guys have to get it right once. And that's, that's the fundamental that, So So these companies have these anti-phishing programs, right? So they do a phishing test, and they find out that 14% of the company falls victims to the phishing. So they do a training program, blah, 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 blah. And they get that down to 2% because you're never going to get it down to zero. And in the first case, when you're at 14%, what percentage of the time were the hackers successful? 100%. The second time, when you got it down to 2%, what percentage were they successful? 100%. There's a reason why Nigerian prince emails were intentionally uh, filled with grammatical errors and misspellings. Because the person that's going to overlook those grammatical errors and misspellings and still answer are the most likely to be gullible by the full con. And to, to Mark's point, if you're going to, uh, it's a spray and pray. If I'm going to push out a thousand emails or a hundred thousand emails in phishing, or if I'm going to get a list of all of your employees from LinkedIn, I am then going to take your thousand employees and try a single password once, you know, one QAZ, two WSX shift and so on, like a keyboard walk. Wait, all hang it on, takes I've got that. Let me write that down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all it takes is one employee to have a bad password or reuse their Netflix password, which is in a, a breach database somewhere for their corporate email. And then they're in. And once an attacker gets domain user access, one, they get access to all of the data that domain user has access to. Most likely, they're not going to trip any of the safeties that you have in place because you look like a valid domain user. And then from there, they can borrow and find a way to laterally maneuver and elevate privileges to become a domain admin. In and fact, in fact was, if you have really good security, what ends up happening is you create this false sense of security. So when people get these emails from coworkers and stuff, they say that must be from them because we have great security. And it yeah. creates a vulnerability in and of itself. Uh, attackers ahead. don't hack in using zero days like the movies most of the time. Often they're just able to log in as a valid domain user. And that's how they get in. And, uh, and, and most of our security is oriented around that kind of extreme cinematic zero day side of the house. But the attackers have adapted to a pretty easy path to get in and not trip any alerts. Yeah. Uh, and the easiest way to get in is to, to get somebody's credentials and go in as them. All right. And the second way, the easiest way to get in is to get them to give you their credentials, to trick them into it. Those two ways, and you know, these are the, we, we, we again, in thinking about the movies, we think about the guy sitting at the keyboard and hacking away and stuff, and that's not how most of it works. Most of it is through an email or some, some social engineering, or they, uh, they put up a site that captures user IDs and passwords and people reuse them and stuff. Um, and the best way to, uh, to defend against it is to try to break into your own network by yourself. By yeah, the way, we, yeah. oh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, we see it time and time again with uh, with um, business email compromise. You know, to the point you log in as a normal user into your your Office 365 account, and you probably you know, these users now are, are emailing their coworkers, quote unquote, and there they can either say, "Hey, the wire transfer instructions changed. Let's use this uh, new wire transfer um, set," or they say, "Hey, I'm having a problem logging into this account. Can I use your login?" And now they just get that. So they're using social engineering under the guise of a coworker. Yep. Uh, we see it time and time again on, on all these big cloud accounts. We've also seen it um, not as much, but a little bit where they actually jump into Teams. So once you log into Office, you then have access to the SharePoint suite of uh, applications. Individuals can then jump into Teams and further that uh, you know false sense of security. And I'm not, I'm not sure if this is um, if this is real or not. But uh, even in the chat for this for this restream play, 
Um, Ann Rinaldi pointed out that there's a, a post at 9.59 a.m. Pacific from Joshua Mosley with a click here on a link and we'll send you a copy of the, of the video. I'm not sure if that's real or not. Ann said it isn't, but that's an example. I mean, that's a, a dot .ly shortened link. I have no idea if that's valid or not. The picture has a LinkedIn to ins instill a form of credibility. And uh, hell, that could absolutely be uh, a, a malicious link that's going to compromise my machine. It is that simple. All it takes is one person to erroneously click on that link in there where it's uncertain of its validity. Yeah, absolutely. Did you see, did you guys see the uh, Conti's, uh, um, you know, release of like the inner works of, of how they operate? It was just really a mind, mind boggling in terms of, you know, the almost like the mundane, like, you know, it's a business, right? So they, these people like go to, go to the office or the virtual office and they, they're trying to attack you on a regular basis. And it's like, uh, you know, using um, almost like mundane tools, as you mentioned, it's, it doesn't have to be like sophistication or, you know, zero day or anything like that. These are, these are like almost known vulnerabilities. Some of them are, you know, years old, right? It's not something new that's been around for, you know, for like two days and nobody knows about. It. I think that's the big thing with log for shell is that, yeah, there was a big surge to fix log for shell. And I think the industry responded pretty quickly, but log for shell is going to be two, three, 10, 15 layers deep in software. And we're going to be identifying new products that are log for shell vulnerable five years from now that no one had any idea of. And so when you think about the ransomware ecosystem, you've got initial access brokers that have found a way to borrow and gain persistence, but they're just sitting there and then they will sell that access to somebody that is motivated to actually take the next step and commit ransomware or commit espionage or whatever else. And this has become a trillion dollar industry uh, alone and, on the malicious the other side. Thing, the other thing is about how we how we do coding. You know, I mean, what we do is uh, very little coding is, is, you know, written from scratch. Most of it is cut and paste from all kinds of programs that solve a particular problem. You're literally grabbing software from everywhere. And once you find particularly a core function that can be compromised, it's going to be embedded in every piece of software or every piece of software that does something. And now you have to do workarounds. And so you have these companies that are hugely vulnerable and have no clue that they are. Yeah. The last year alone, um, the top two entry points, actually last three years, uh, 2019 to 2021, uh, the top two entry points for any organization that was hacked by ransomware was um, uh, phishing emails and then uh, exploiting uh, RDP, remote desktop protocol. Right. Um, and it doesn't take much, right? You send that crafted email to any individual, whether it's a, a specifically targeted to that organization or that, that individual, um, or it's more of that spray and pray. You send that crafted email, the individual clicks that link, downloads, launches that back door. It's going to bypass your MFA products. It's going to bypass a lot of those perimeter security products. Uh, likewise with RDP. If you have an RDP, if you have a system exposed to the internet uh, broadcasting RDP, or you've quote unquote hidden the port from 3389 to something different, these, these guys uh, aren't dumb. They know what these these little tricks are. They're going to look for it, and they're going to bang on those uh, doors uh, all day long until they, they get in. So when you talk about initial access brokers, when you talk about you know um, something maybe a little deeper like the uh, the Cobalt Strike frameworks that are that are out there, are these uh, command and control frameworks, um, it, it gets pretty complex pretty quick. But the activity itself, these behaviors we're seeing from a security perspective, are the exact same thing. They're all okay. cookie cutter it, from client network to client, victim network to victim network. It's all the same thing. The good news about them is many of them are lazy and many of them use and reuse the same tools and techniques, which is an advantage to you if you're willing to try to use those tools and techniques to hack your own system and figure out where your vulnerabilities are. Uh, but there's really two kinds of hackers, right? They're, they're the spray and pray. I'm going to try this, see, see what it works on. And then they're the ones who say, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to get. And I'm going to spend as much time, energy, and resources as necessary to get into this system. And the problem is a potential victim is you don't know which one's after you. The vast majority of people are worried about spray and pray, script kitty type of stuff. And, and a dedicated hacker who really wants to get in will get in one way or the other. And then you start getting into, okay, let's, let's move away from the idea of prevention and move towards the idea of resilience. So you need to do both strategies. That's um, and, and actually, Mark, kind of building on your point, I we I think we will as an industry start to evolve away from the term of 
securing my environment because that's about kind of prevention in a point in time and more about how do I build a defensible enterprise? Right. And if you assume the attacker is going to get in and the attacker will get in, there's just way too many doors and windows for them to get in. Defensibility is how do you detect that they're there? How do you detect that they're trying to laterally move? What can you do to stifle them? And then in many ways, how do you shape shift your environment? Uh, flipping and changing the way that you've segmented, changing your identity, your privilege access, and all these other knobs and levers that affect your the defensibility of your enterprise right. in order to stifle and prevent the attacker from succeeding in their objective. Because what you want to do is increase the cost of attack to the point where you're no longer attractive. It's just like swimming. You don't need to outswim the shark. You just got to swim faster than the slowest guy. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is too many of our defenses are based at the network level. All right. We, we concentrate all of our energies at the network level, not on the operating system level, not and particularly not at the data level. Uh, you know, if you're now th this isn't true for ransomware, but for ordinary thefts and stuff like that, if your data is encrypted properly and that encryption is implemented well and the credentials are well managed, um, you know, essentially you can leave your data out on the, on the table. Uh, but the problem is we're not doing any of those things. And so we rely on the network level to save us. And the problem with the network level is there's so many different ways to, to, to bypass it. And the easiest one is with a decent credential. Look like the good guy. You know, if, if I'm sitting here like listening to you guys. So, you know, if you look at the industry, people are consciously saying, uh, well, listen, I, I do what I'm supposed to do. I, I have a patching, uh, you know, system in place. I do pen testing, you know, once or twice a year. I do security awareness for my employees. I have uh, multi-factor authentication on my systems. You know, what else can I do? I mean, it's just why is it not sufficient to to uh, you know to protect my organization despite the fact that I'm doing all the right things? I think the the key things there those are those are good nouns, right? But you're missing the verb train like you fight. It's one thing to have all that. You've got to train like you fight so you know that they're all working there. And then the difference is uh, sparring with Mike Tyson and playing Mike Tyson's punch out. There's a market difference between those two experiences. And I think a lot of people are just sitting around playing Tyson's punch out uh, thinking that it's good enough. You've got to train like you fight and exercise your security controls, exercise your posture through the eyes of the attacker so you know what's working and what's not working and there's a yeah. difference between education training and culture okay and most people do education here's a five minute click through answer three questions boom you've been trained for the next six months okay or you've been educated and even education people don't incorporate that they just say okay i, I learn enough so that i can pass this thing and i can take it again so if i fail just do it again so i get a click enough random boxes that i've passed Training is where you train people what to do and train like you fight. But the third one is incorporation of this into your day-to-day -day business. And that's the one thing that we have a really hard time because companies have lots of things they need to do. If you ask a CISO the most important thing in a company, they're going to say information security. Well, very few companies are in the information security business. They're in the making widgets digits business. They're in the real estate business. So what you really need to do is show how this is not just a loss prevention issue. But that if you do this right, you can make money. So you sit there and say, listen, we don't have to have 20,000 tellers because we've got electronic banking because we did it right. So that's the other thing is aligning information security metrics and goals with the metrics and goals of the organization. So you can get the resources and you can show people that information security isn't just part of your job. It's a nice thing to do. It helps you perform better. Yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. The the culture, stressing the culture aspect of of these businesses, starting at the the level of the board, all the way into the organization to the newest intern or the lowest level employee, having having the C suite, having the board uh, be visible, talking about these security concepts, uh, having them be educated about this, uh, will change the the culture. It will shift that culture um, of the organization into a security mindset. Um, and then the other other point I'll throw out there, which I think has been highlighted in the, the chat here, 
is the governance programs, right? You know, Sneha uh, kindly pointed out, you have all these different pieces. You have patching, you have uh, security operations, you have training uh, that are going on. The governance aspect needs to tie everything together. It's great that you have patching, but is your patching effective? Is it, are you meeting SLAs? Is a zero day getting, you know, that, that's, that's critical to your organization? Is that getting patched in a, in a critical time frame? Uh, has it been tested? Has the SOC confirmed that it's actually fixed? You know, just saying that a patch has been deployed doesn't necessarily mean it's working and effective. So, so having that governance program really look at the training metrics, understanding who are the repeat offenders. Let's really cater to them and, and really teach them what what it is that they can expose the company to. Tying that all the way into the patching program and the ability to respond, purple teaming. Uh, it's absolutely critical that that all these pieces of your security program one become the culture and two are interconnected together. I want to kind of build on Steve's point, but before that, point out that the dude's got like a liter of coffee next to him. And I'm in <laughs> awe of his. Uh, <laughs> Hold that crap up, will you? Yeah. Thirty-two <laughs> full ounces. This thing stays cold or warm all day long. Um, so you know, it's funny Steve's point of, of of patching. So we had a customer where they applied the zero logon patch, and the Microsoft report showed it was patched. The Qualys report showed it was patched. And then when they ran an autonomous pen test with us, we exploited zero logon and got the keys to the kingdom. And the reaction was, no way this is possible. We are patched. Look at all these reports. Well, as we dug into it, when you apply the zero logon patch, step one is modify the Microsoft registry keys to say that it's patched. Step two is apply the binaries. Well, silence blocked the binaries from being applied. So these guys had misreported their zero logon status for 18 months and they had no idea that they were still exploitable until we proved it and we showed the proof of exploit and so on. So they now have, in addition to patch Tuesday, pen test Wednesday, because just applying the patch doesn't mean that you're no longer exploitable. You have to be exploiting to prove and verify that you've patched correctly or that you've fixed a particular misconfig correctly because you can't just trust a, a report that isn't necessarily trying to exploit the environment. And I think we're so, going to continue to see stories like that. I have something called like the Kubler-Ross model of data breaches. All right. Whenever there's a data breach, the first step is anger. Okay. Then comes denial. And then and, and denial, you sit there and go, there's no way you could have done this. There isn't any way that you could have done this. You couldn't have taken any of my data. And of course, part of us is like, well, we did. Okay. And, and then comes, you know, blame shifting. Okay. The, what I call the SEP field. It's someone else's problem. Right. Um, and ultimately, there is uh, uh, acceptance, and then I say the next steps are uh, litigation, regulatory compliance, and class action lit uh, litigation. Those are the the, the cooler Ross of, of uh, uh, data breaches. But the first step is to sit there and say it did not happen, and it could not have happened because we are doing this, and that happens in every data breach. Or we don't have that kind of data. We don't collect that kind of data. And then somebody shows you, oh, well, okay, well, yeah, of course we collect that kind of data. So this happens all the time. Um, and almost always you learn much more about your network after having had a breach. Because the breach tells you that, you know, that data you didn't think you were collecting? Well, you are collecting it. Um, yes, and it, it is Douglas Adams. SEP field is the, yeah. is the, um, the cloak of invisibility. So you know, Mark, Mark, Mark just described my sales cycle, by the way. <laughs> we go through that process. They're like, nope, no way. And then we show them the proof. They're like, uh, maybe. And then we continue to go like, yep, you're, you're, and, you, you got us. <laughs> and you have the, the full sense of security of having these reports saying it, all the systems are patched. It, that's like the most scariest thing in the world because, I, you know, you, you feel like you have, you know, that comfort level that, okay, our systems are, you know, compliant. We have all the patches in a row. But yet it's, it's, you know, that, that loop was not closed on that. And you, know, um, you have, a, you have a perverse regulatory model that rewards compliance over security. Right. And, and uh, building on Mark's point, you know what's the worst feeling? Is seeing your data on Conti's website. Um, you know, that's a worse feeling. But the other thing is, and, I've, and I, this is my attitude at, at GE and elsewhere, when we get breached, my, regula my regulator's name isn't going to be in the news. My name is going to be in the news. So being compliant doesn't mean I'm secure. Right. And I can't shift blame to my auditor. It's me. I own it. And you've just got, just got to accept that level of responsibility or go work in 
finance or something that isn't security. Right. And, you know, it's funny because we talk about the target breach. We don't talk about the breach of the HVAC contractor. We talk about, you know, the so so the to a great extent, what we do in both in law policy and all that stuff is we blame the victims. The breach is that of the gets the name of the victim, not the name of the attacker. And we lose sight of the fact that these victims are, in fact, victims of crime. Uh, and they may not have done everything. And they may not have done everything perfectly. And they may have done nothing. And in fact, some, to, to some extent, companies that do nothing never report cyber breaches because they have no clue they have it. That's right. You know, so I'd love to t- take some, you know, some action items. What can, can companies do? And Snehal, you offer your node zero to companies that are, you know, are in doubt. They, they currently have, uh, they have a mechanism in place. They do, as you mentioned, they do the right things, right? And, uh, you know, still there, there's a lot of unknowns. So what's the process of getting that, um, you know, implemented in their environment or at least tested uh, so they can see what, what's, uh, what they don't know, the blind spots? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so real quick, um, we're big fans of letting results do the talking. And so anyone can, can go kick off an autonomous pen test for free, go through the website and uh, go start a free trial and go, go pen test your environment and let those results do the talking and let those results blow you away. And really what we see with our customers is two forms of adoption. The first is a no notice pen test against the SOC or their MSSP to measure how quickly they detect the attack is occurring. And then if they ever detect it. Yeah, and never. In fact, there was one where uh, the pen test lasted 45 minutes. It took Dell SecureWorks seven hours to send a generic notice saying, we think there's some suspicious activity. So you can imagine the awkward conversation between that customer of ours and Dell SecureWorks of like, hey guys, your SLAs are a bit of a problem here. These guys are in and out before you even sent us, you sent us a notification effectively a full work day later. Yeah. Uh, so one is audit your audit, the SLAs of your SOC and your MSSP is, is one. And that's where you're going to find ineffective security controls. And then the other is deciding what not to fix, which is, that was a big struggle I had on the, on the user side. If I choose not to fix something, I'm implicitly accepting that liability as a C-level executive. So what I need to focus on is not what's vulnerable, but what's actually exploitable in using proof of exploitation to decide what to prioritize and what not to prioritize because I've got limited capacity to fix problems. And those become the two primary initial use cases that customers will use us for. Um, The bulk of our users are not security people, by the way. They are IT admins and network engineers that have to do the actual fixing. And they use us to proactively harden their environment. But yeah, you can get up and running for free right now and let those results do the talking. Do you have to worry that there's, um, you know, sometimes they, you know, for pen testing, there's always a fear of like, oh, what would it take down my my infrastructure? Uh, you know, what are the consequences of doing that? Uh, you know, can you uh, comment on that? So yeah, there's. Let me, comment, let me comment real quickly from right. a legal sure. standpoint. Okay, yeah. if mm-hmm. you're externally doing a pen test, I have rules of engagement that we have and how to turn it off and and how to minimize harm to production environments. However, and and I think Tony was going to say this is, the real attackers don't care. They're going to attack uh, everything. So so the best way to do it is on on somebody that you can call off and turn it off uh, if you have to. But if you have a particularly brittle environment. You would much rather know that when you run a pen test than when the hackers run the pen test. Said perfectly. A concrete <laughs> example is um, a typical misconfiguration is you don't route your RFC 1918 network traffic to null. So what happens is um, as an attacker is starting to enumerate all the IPs, you, they end up bouncing between the load balancer and the firewall. And that bouncing is because the load balancer doesn't can't resolve this IP, shoots it to the firewall, can't resolve it gets routed back and forth, and that can effectively cause a denial of service attack. That's a simple misconfig. And by the way, if you do that and your border gateway isn't configured properly, then you could actually break out and, and hit the IP range of another customer of your same ISP. Right, and, and your that, ISP should be noticing that and not notifying you, and they're not going to do it. Correctly, exactly. And so these are problems you want to know ahead of time. Now. Uh, if you do something irresponsible and you execute blue key and it takes out a dialysis machine and you kill somebody, totally different conversation. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's because you don't 
You don't need to exploit blue. Uh, bl exploiting blue keep is actually quite risky. You could destabilize environments. So how far can you go before the actual destabilizing effect to be able to prove that this is a problem? We're really good at knowing what that threshold is, which is why we've never caused a production issue. But to, to Mark's point, I would rather know of that brittleness in my environment ahead of time versus trying to react to it during crisis. And, and, and you know, sure. and, and controlling how far you go, I'm in, I'm over, and I can do this uh, is different from I'm in, I'm over, and I have done this. Uh, it's that last step usually that's going to be destructive. I did a pen test, an external pen test on a large company in um, Louisville, Kentucky, and I shut them down and cost them $2 million worth of loss. And I got a letter from the C CISO saying, thank you. He said, because you shut us down at a low production environment at a low time. If a hacker had done it, it would have been $20 million. And the $2 million loss got me the budget I needed to be able to prevent the $20 million loss. So it's a matter of managing expectations as well. And, 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 sure and writing the appropriate things in your legal agreement so they say, you can't sue me. <laughs> and I'm sure you, uh, Snehali, you probably vet the, the folks uh, so they don't do that on their local parking authority. Um, you know, without uh, without permission. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're, uh, we spent a lot of money on lawyers to make sure that our stuff was tight. <laughs> you can never spend too much money on lawyers. I, <laughs> I will disagree with you passionately about that one, but I get your consent. Well, Mark, we'll create a T-shirt. We'll say that just in the back that you can never spend it's, too much money it's on implied. lawyers. It's implied. It's implied. <laughs> uh, so what's the easiest way for, for folks to reach uh, reach out to you, Sneil and uh, Mark and Steve? for like further conversations, uh, feedback, uh, whatever else the case may be. Well, but for one, I, I didn't realize I was, I was on a panel with a celebrity like Mark. I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to get your virtual autograph after this and put it up on the wall behind me. <laughs> me too, please. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm that, 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 in for one. That, your your that, composure, that, despite that volume of coffee is impressive. <laughs> so I have these huge, huge cups of coffee, right? And so somebody came in my office and said, you must, I said, why do you have such big cups of coffee? I said, because I like to drink a lot of coffee. And they said, you must like to drink a lot of cold coffee. <laughs> yeah. I just have small hands. This is like an eight ounce cup. <laughs> uh, that's that's it. Well, listen, I, for me, you can reach me either at MDR, Mark Daryl Rash. I didn't pick the Daryl. Um, MDR at KJK.com, which is Corman, Jackson, and Krantz, KJK. Or the easier way is MDRash, R-A-S-C-H, at Gmail. I actually use my Gmail account because it's easier to get to and stuff. So MDRash at Gmail gets me. Um, and then you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Google, and um, not in the Ukraine. I, by the way, in Ukraine. The background I have right now is um, um, Freedom Square in Ukraine. So. Uh, you know, Steve? Yeah, you can reach me at my email address at Arite. It's S Ramey, R A M as in Mary, E Y, at Arite, A R E T E I R dot com. Perfect. And Snehel? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's the, the probably the best way to, to get in touch with me. And then my, my last name at horizon3.ai. So A N T A N I at horizon3.ai. And, and I would love to have a further discussion on the use of AI in information security, what works, what's smart, and what's hype, and what's bullshit. Yeah, we should definitely do that soon as well as to discuss some of the, you know, maybe some of the past cases you've done, Mark. And uh, Steve, you, I know you and I have, uh, have another session on the go as well to talk about some, uh, uh, you know, some of your experience in incident response. And Snehal, as always, a real pleasure. You know, I, I admire the work you do uh, at uh, Horizon 3 and others. Thank you very much for joining all. all. And uh, until then, uh, stay safe online as well as offline. Looking forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.